to say with a gun You'll never trust anyone the devil knows That's a price of gold So don't you sell your soul for gold That's his price for gold That might have sorry man who sold That might have gone Give us strength till the hand that should have known. That's the price of gold. That's the price of gold. Hello, and welcome to the first Django Rising podcast. This is the only podcast dedicated to the classic Euro-Westerns of the 1960s, 70s, and beyond. You can call me the Drifting Avenger. Um, the, audio, the audio quality to this podcast and my delivery will um, hopefully improve over time. Um, it has a few ups and downs in this episode, but as I learn, I will definitely put effort into this podcast and try to improve it. This podcast will also have a format that varies from week to week. Some episodes will be longer, like today's episode. Other episodes will be shorter. Um, they will only review maybe a single film or respond to something interesting that I came across on the internet about the topic of European Westerns. Um, in this podcast, we're going to take a look at the Spanish Western. We're going to take a brief survey of them by looking at three of the best Spanish Westerns. The Ugly Ones, For a Few Bullets More, and The Fury of Johnny Kidd. Spanish westerns are quite a bit different than, in terms of tone, story, and style from the contemporaneous Italian westerns. Um, like I said, these are three of the best and three of the most accessible. After that, I will take a quick look at an interesting German-Spanish co-production, Heider's Gang, from 1973. This movie is really interesting because it's part of the German New Wave cinema. Um, I hope you find this show interesting. I hope you tolerate the ups and downs in terms of technological issues. Um, please subscribe on YouTube, Vimeo, and also check out the Django Rising blog. Um, right now, we will go into a brief break, and then we'll take a look at the Spanish Western. seen him before, but believe me, he's fast. I believe you. He's fast, because something's driving him on. Someone knows what, but nobody's talking. There's a river of gold here, and all it takes is a little lead to have it run through your fingers. Stranger, I take it this is the river you want to wash your butt in, as you put it. But already death is waiting from the muzzle of a coat. At the end of the rainbow. One name brings back the dead. Brings back buried memories. Bursts of fire eat into the brain. There's no more suffering. Only hate. A woman. That's not nice. I will never stop hating you. A woman for everyone. A wildcat with a silken skin. <laughs> Two 
eyes stricken with horror which hide a violent mystery. Careful, Lawrence. It's used by the Indians to invoke the spirit of the dead. Oh, Emiliano. I want you to find those two, you hear? And I want them alive! Only one thing lives in the village of the dead. All you have left is your gun. Now's the moment to use it. The end of the rainbow. So for this first Django Rising podcast, we're going to look at three Spanish westerns. Um, the Ugly Ones, For a Few Bullets More, and Fury of Johnny Kidd. Um, even though it's kind of arbitrary calling something a Spanish or an Italian western, because the cast and crews of these films were international. There were German, Italian, and Spanish um, cast, crew, and production companies involved. But in another way, um, there are different focuses or themes that are brought out by movies that are written or directed by Spaniards versus those that are made more by Italians. Um, and that's what I want to look at today because I find this distinction really fascinating. I also find that Spanish westerns are really overlooked, which is really unfortunate because even though in many ways they are, they are a little less accessible and a little less flashy than their Italian counterparts, they're really excellent movies. Um, so the first thing I would like to like bring up is the fact that these movies are defined by a very particular type of plot. So in order to talk about the Spanish plot, first I'm going to talk very briefly about the Italian plot. Um, so most Italian westerns made after 1964 follow kind of this general plot pattern that was established by Fistful of Dollars. In this movie you have a almost super heroic gunman. Um, he can shoot faster than everyone else. He's a real badass. He can outthink everyone. But he eventually gets involved in some sort of situation where he comes up against someone who is at least his equal. And he is captured. After being captured, he is you know, beaten, humiliated, and sometimes even like literally crucified. This happens in film after film. In many films, he's even buried. Then he returns from the dead, like Clint Eastwood walking out of the smoke in um, Fistful of Dollars. Um, and he's kind of a spectral character out there to get his revenge. And um, he also inadvertently like frees the community from the evil people that are calling the shots there. Spanish westerns are very different. Spanish westerns have a plot in which you have an innocent figure, um, played oftentimes by someone like um, Peter Lee Lawrence, who has really like boyish looks. And he, um, he kills someone, he stabs someone, or shoots someone to protect something that he cares about, to protect, to, to protect himself. Um, from powerful people in the society that are corrupting him. Um, so and then he becomes involved in a cycle of retribution, in a cycle of violence, um, in which each step, each, each step that he makes, each step in his journey, he um, makes choices that make sense. We empathize with them as an audience, but over time he becomes more and more um, corrupted by the violence. Violence is a contagion infected him. And over time, he eventually becomes the equivalent of the people, the tyrants in society that had created him. Um, and then it, society, in order to stop this, um, this cycle of violence, it has to purge the hero, the hero that we care about. But the interests of society rise above the individual that we care about, and they have to be removed. I don't really know how to interpret this plot completely. It's really interesting. It's tapping into something in Iberian culture during the time of the Franco dictatorship or following the brutal civil war there in the 1930s. 
Um, there seems to be a morality of social good over individual good. And that kind of makes sense um, when you're talking about fascist filmmakers. Um, Joaquin Marchand, who um, kind of um, initiated this plot type in Gunfight at High Noon, um, his classic movie from, I believe, 1963, um, his father was um, very close to the fascist dictatorship. Um, and I believe um, Joaquin Marchant was as well. But later in his life, his movies tend to get a little more um, subversive. So the first movie that I'm going to look at was made in 1967. This is Eugenio Martin's The Ugly Ones. Um, it was ultimately based, it, it was based on an American paperback western by Marvin Albert that came out about a decade before the movie was made. Um, this movie is one of the most accessible Spanish westerns. It captures a classic Leone-esque style with great cinematography by Enzo Barboni, who you will know from blending um, Django, and he also directed the Trinity movies. And there's also a classic score by Stelvio Cipriani. Um, this score shows up a lot. It's a really good one. Um, as soon as you see the credits, it'll, it'll be familiar to you. Um, although director Eugenio Martino helmed around 30 films, this is the only one in which he really rises above mediocrity, and here he creates a really iconic movie. Um, the movie has three main characters engaged in something resembling almost a love triangle, um, but Richard Weiler, played by um, Richard Weiler, plays Luke Chilson, who is a um, efficient capitalist and bounty killer. He's only motivated by money. And the, the, the townspeople who are central to this film, um, even though they're in the background watching what's going on for the most part, um, they are initially um, disgusted by him. Um, and and um, Richard Weiler was mostly a bit, er, bit actor or television actor, but here he's actually pretty efficient, even though he's really overshadowed by Tomas Milian. Tomas Milian was a young actor, studio-trained actor, who was really excited to show what he could do. And here he's really amazing as um, the social bandit Jose Gomez, um, who is a complex character, somewhat like um, Gian Maria Volante's um, El Indio and For a Few Dollars More. He engages in very sadistic violence, but he's um, and it's very cynical violence with um, kind of some ambivalent disgust and pleasure really interesting it's really effective um he's a tr he's a character who has a sense of his own kind of tragic fate and finally helena zaluska portrays eden whose loyalties are catalytic catalytic to the center of the film she was a childhood friend of jose gomez um and her choices on her choices their fates the bounty hunter and the bandit their fates hinge on her choices she, oftentimes she comes off as being somewhat passive, always watching what's going on. But what I think is going on here is really interesting. I think that Eugenio Martin is using her as the audience's proxy. Initially, she, the townspeople, and maybe even the audience sympathize more with um, Jose Gomez. Um, he's kind of this tragic, sad figure. But eventually, as they see the effects of him and his band on the community, you side with the bounty hunter, Luke Chilson. So um, the um, Spaghetti Western database has a good synopsis, which I'll read very briefly. The bounty hunter Luke Chilson is trailing convicted bandit Jose Gomez, who has been assisted in his escape by a childhood friend from his village, Eden. Chilson attempts to take Gomez back into custody, but he is thwarted by the loyalty of the local people, all of whom remember Gomez fondly and believe he has been driven to banditry through injustice and persecution. However, as Gomez's friends descend on the settlement, Old friendships are tested, and loyalties begin to unravel. So the backstory of Jose Gomez makes him into the archetypal tragic hero of the Spanish Western. He is the child of an old Spanish family that was dispossessed of its wealth. At one point during his youth, he was defending himself against racist soldiers, and he killed one. After that, he follows the trajectory of all kind of these Spanish characters in these films, and um, he ends up as this really violent bandit. What makes this movie um, also very accessible to people who are very familiar with Sergio Leone or Sergio Corbucci movies is that the um, bounty hunter Luke Chilson um, follows kind of the classic Italian plot. Italian movies, like I said, are based, have a character who is captured, um, humiliated, even crucified, and then comes back and saves everything. Here, 
that happens again. So you have these two parallel plots, the Italian plot and the Spanish plot. It makes it very familiar. Um, it makes this movie very accessible. Um, highlighting the cast are, is, is a shaved Mario Braga, looking the way he does in The Great Silence. And Helena Zaluska is beautiful and actually fairly effective. Like I said, this movie sent, what's really interesting about this movie is these two characters, even though they are so potent and powerful, it is the decisions of the community. Um, Mario Brega as a blacksmith, Helena Zaluska as the childhood friend. Um, there is an old sheriff who sides initially with Jose Gomez. As their perceptions of Jose Gomez change over time, um, that determines the balance of power between the two characters. Um, and also Eugenio Martin does a really wonderful job directing this movie. Um, as Jose Gomez kind of descends into madness um, in a really enjoyable way, the movie becomes more and more surreal and a little bit strange. And this is almost as if he's dramatizing this change in his character um, for the watching townspeople and the audience at the same time. It's really cool. It's really smart. It's really interesting. Um, it's a well-made movie. So the next movie we're going to look at is um, a movie that I think is really underrated, Julio Books, um, For a Few Bullets More. That was, that came, this movie also came out in 1967. Um, this movie at first kind of looks like a um, 1950s B-American Westerns, but it's um, a B-Western in which like something's a little bit off. Um, and so you could you would kind of have the sense that maybe that was because this movie was really cheap or maybe because it was really bad. Um, that would be the wrong way, I think, to interpret this movie. Um, instead, this is a really good movie, I think. Um, Julio Books is known for a string of several hero westerns, including Mestizo or um, Joaquin Murrieta and um, the really well-known Bullets for Sandoval. All of them follow this basic Spanish plot that I've been talking about. A uh, Bullet for Sandoval is a much better known film and a much more widely available film. Um, it has a classic score and over-the-top set pieces. Um, but its transformation of its hero is a bit more abrupt. And I find um, this movie, for a few bullets more, much more satisfying. Um, so this movie pretty much follows um, the well-known story of Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. The Spanish title to the movie is The Man Who Shot Billy the Kid. That should give you, um, that That title mirrors um, the classic John Ford movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. If you know anything about that movie, that title will tell you a lot about the underlying structure of this film and the relationship between um, the way things are reported and the truth. Um, but that's really kind of a side note to the overall movie. In this movie, um, Billy's mother is attacked by um, one of the powerful McGregor brothers. Um, there, He wants to sexually assault her, essentially. Billy kills her to defend her, and this sets off this um, chain reaction of violence that I've been talking about. Um, after each series of shootings, Billy crosses both a psychological and a geographic barrier. Um, and the geographic barriers are things like um, rivers or deserts. And it, this um, serves as a powerful um, visual symbolic device for the viewer. It's really cool. It was pretty well thought out. Um, even though Billy started out defending his mother from sexual assault, in the end he becomes the um, equivalent of the McGregor brothers. Um, he is the person that people fear. He is the one that wields violence. He's the one who enjoys wielding violence and taking what he wants. Um, so he eventually decides to um, try to take an amnesty because he's fallen in love with a young woman. But when he tries to return home to his community, he finds um, that you can't go home again. Um, and the villagers meet him with fear and hostility. In the end, both he and Pat Garrett can escape their intertwined fates. Peter Lee Lawrence is familiar to a lot of people from his first major role in the flashback scene to um, for a few dollars more. Here, um, he does a good job as Billy. He's no Tomas Milian, but he is sympathetic enough um, in this movie. Um, he is badly dubbed, however, in the English version. Um, like fellow pretty boy Giuliano Gemma, Lawrence is definitely an acquired taste. However, um, his, he started a number of really solid westerns, and this is a good, solid B-western. Spanish westerns were often statically and staged and photographed. But Julio Books um, always did a decent job with camera movements and interesting compositions. The movie attempts and ultimately fails to be something of an epic. 
Um, there are a number of side characters that are introduced but not well developed before they're killed or they disappear from the screen. But even with these latter faults, this is a better Western than it might appear to be. If you're in the mood, this can be a very effective B Western. So for the third movie and the final movie that I'll be looking at, um, I'm going to look at the, the previously hard-to-get Spanish Western Fury of Johnny Kidd. The always enthusiastic authors of the Western a la Italiana book series, Antonio Bruschini and Federico de Signo, compare Fury of Johnny Kidd favorably with Giulio Questi's notorious Django Kill. Um, they call it totally fascinating and unforgettable. I really have to agree with this assessment. Each time I watch this film, my appreciation for it grows. Like Django Kill, it is a violent, surreal, cartoonish, acid western. Um, the movie is based on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, but it has a twist ending and a motivating love triangle. Bruschini and De Signo provide a, a good synopsis. In a Californian village on the Mexican border, the Campos and the Mounters are fighting over various land properties. In order to avenge the murder of a relative, the Campos kidnap Johnny Mounters. When he sets himself free with the aid of an elderly, one-handed bandit, he asks his new friend to teach him the art of gunfighting. During a stagecoach heist, Johnny meets Campos' daughter, Juliet, and falls in love with her. This doesn't please the two families at all, so their feud grows even worse, ending in an all-out massacre. Only the two young lovers are left alive in the end, and they decide to leave the village, now turned into a graveyard, looking for a better future. This movie was made by the Italian director Gianni Puccini, who was known more for social dramas and satires. Um, the violence in the movie apparently really disgusted him, and he had a second unit, had a second unit director shoot the, um, the scenes of violence that he considered very extreme. Um, I included the film in this um, survey of the Spanish Western because it follows a variation of the Spanish plot with the exemplar actor of this type of plot, Peter Lee Lawrence. As with For a Few Bullets More, um, Peter Lee Lawrence's character, Johnny, starts out as an innocent. But after he learns to shoot, um, he enjoys indulging in violence. He likes the power. Unlike the other two films, however, this film has a very different resolution to this basic problem. So in Spanish Westerns, right, corrupt societies create monsters. However, in this movie, instead of purging society of the monsters, the hero in the film is redeemed, and it is society that is destroyed in what is essentially a very memorable um, apocalyptic climax. Euro-Western regulars, Peter Martel and Piero Lully, are wonderful as the sadistic heavies in the movie, and they have a, a really strange kind of homoerotic relationship centered around um, this episode when Piero Lully, who is the corrupt sheriff, tries to shoot down Peter Martel's character. He's one of the Campos brothers. And um, their bullets literally merge in air, in the air, and um, it's as interpreted as their, their fates are intertwined. Um, it's, it's, it's silly and awesome, like the scene of the, of the, um, digging the gold bullets out in, um, Django Kill. Um, this film has great exaggerated compositions by cinematographer Mario Montori, and it has a great score by Gino, Peru, Gino Paguri. Um, if you like the, um, gothic, over-the-top, LSD-inspired style of Django Kill or Matalo, you will really enjoy this film. Um, just as a side note, the movie also has a brief cameo by Paul Nasky, the, the notorious actor of all those Spanish horror films. So how do I rate each of these three movies? To check out my rating criteria, please go to the Django Rising podcast blog. Here, I will rate each movie in terms of its accessibility to modern audiences, as well as within my own Euro-Western rating scale. By accessibility, I'm referring to whether the film is similar in style and themes to the movies that most people are familiar with, such as Sergio Leone's The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, or Sergio Corbucci's Django. The Ugly Ones is shot like a spaghetti western, and its score definitely sounds like one. This movie is the best introduction to the Spanish western, in my opinion. I give it a 4 for accessibility. Overall, I consider this movie to be a genre classic, and I give it an 8.5. For A Few Bullets More has a number of spaghetti flourishes, 
but it may appear more similar to the B-Westerns of the 1950s than The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. This is a less accessible movie for this reason, and I give it a 3. If you are new to the Spanish Western, you will not get much out of this movie. Overall, I consider this to be a really solid movie, though, and I rate it 7.75. As I said earlier, my appreciation of Fury of John and Kate has grown over time. While it has great Italian Western style and music, the exaggeration of this movie may be somewhat strange for some viewers. This movie gets a 3 for accessibility. However, overall I give this movie an 8. This movie is also a classic. So now I would like to briefly review another film that I found really interesting, kind of a really unusual film, in that it was part of the German New Wave cinema, so it's coming at Westerns from a very different place. Damn It America, or Heider's Gang, is a somewhat enigmatic film, because it's not widely you know, available anywhere, and I don't think it's legitimately available on any recent DVD releases. So the film is little known in the English-speaking world, and that is really unfortunate. Like a handful of other German revisionist westerns, um, like Chitan Indian Boy, this film seems to be something of a critique of the classic Winnetou films of the previous decade. While the Winnetou movies took place in a Karl May fantasy west, these later films portray a grimy, darker, more ambivalent frontier. So Heider's Gang appears to be a sequel, actually, to an earlier film by director Volker Vogler, um, Heider the Lonely Hunter. According to this one German uh, movie website that I looked at, the earlier movie is the story of a Bavarian poacher around 1875 who rebels against the feudal authorities, and after the, death, the violent death of his wife and his brother, he takes a brutal revenge. This is the first full-length feature film by Volker Vogler and part of a series of critical homeland films in German cinema of those years. 
Here, however, it is an adventure in the Western Alps. The effective but too spectacular staging pushes the socially critical moments into the background. According to film critic Wolfgang Limmer, around the time that, that movie came out, 1971, Vogler adapts the topology of the spaghetti western for Bavarian conditions, which is kind of cool. It is hard to find a copy of this earlier movie, which is really unfortunate. However, in the movie that I'm looking at right now, um, Heider's gang were following the um, continuing adventures of the poacher's gang, five members of his gang. According to another German website, five Bavarian poachers in jail dream of America, the land of freedom. In 1885, they are deported and try to make their dream come true. They immigrate to America and end up in the western town of Yankton. But there, they are treated like dirt by the inhabitants and are forced to perform the lowest forms of work. Finally, they fall into the hands of Doc Holliday and his girlfriend, Katie Elder, who exploit them for a bank robbery. Four of them are killed. Katie Elder's last words are, damn it, America. So, Hyder's Gang was a pleasant surprise when I first watched it a couple of years ago. It is filled with great images and surreal humor. This movie's frontier is one of displaced immigrants wistful for a return home. It's full of petty tyrants reproducing the same violent social structures of the old world, and it's a frontier of boredom and poverty. And though the film seems interested in letting the air out of the frontier fantasies of Karl May and other Hollywood and, well, and Hollywood westerns, Vogler does so gently. For this movie to work, it relies on a mixture of cinematic western conventions with uh, grimy realism to realize its often distance and artificial effects. The movie has a self-conscious style, which reminds me of the movies of Vogler's important contemporary Rainer Fassbender. In fact, this movie was a part of the German New Wave, and it kind of looks like one of those movies, so it'll be a little unusual for someone looking for Sergio Leone. This movie wasn't emotionally effective for me, I gotta admit. I liked the dislocated German poachers and the final images of the religious goody-goody firing a gun alone on the frontier. It's really evocative. But the movie did not really move me. However, it was really interesting and definitely worth a watch. It's one of the best German westerns, I think. Euro Western regular William Burr is decent in his role of Doc Holliday. It's one of his better um, late Euro Western roles. Other actors familiar from Spaghetti Westerns include Eduardo Fajardo, Dan Van Hoosen, Luis Barbo, and Alfonso de la Vega. The movie was shot in the Colmenar Viejo in Spain, which is really familiar to Euro Western fans, um, particularly with a lot of earlier, like Spanish and Italian Westerns. While it would be tempting to speculate that this use of these actors and places reflects a conscious effort by Vogler to rework the imagery of the spaghetti western for his own purposes. I would suspect that it actually reflects the input of the Spanish co-producers. On the other hand, the movie makes at least one obvious nod to Corbucci's Django. So maybe the inclusion of these locations and actors was some sort of deliberate commentary. I'm not really sure. The movie may have been followed by another sequel, um, Valley of the Dancing Women in 1975, but I can't find much information about that film. So in terms of how I would rate this movie, um, I, given that the movie was part of the German New Wave, it might be challenging in two ways. First, if you're not familiar with these films, then it might take a moment to get your bearing. Second, if you are expecting something similar to the films of Leone or Kabuchi, you will be disappointed. So I give this movie a 2 for accessibility. Overall, I gave this movie an 8.25 out of 10. Even though it's not a complete success, it is a genre classic deserving of more attention than it has received so far. I really recommend this movie. <laughs> You can't meet him face to face. And you can't turn your back on him. What can you say about Sabata except adios? Adios, Sabata. Yul Brunner as Sabata. Each clip 
for his sawed-off lever action 3030 contains seven rimfire Remington cartridges and one cigar. Ewell Brunner as Sabata. They say you can judge a man by the company he keeps, like Gypsy. When he starts dancing, people start dying. September, every inch a killer, right down to his toes. The gringo, when he went by the book, so did you. The colonel, a marksman who never missed a chance to practice. What can you say about Sabata except adios? Adios, Sabata. It's no wonder he always wears black. So thanks for watching or listening to the first episode of the Django Rising podcast. Um, it's a little rough, and I hope our audio quality improves. I hope my uh, delivery improves quite a bit in future episodes. Um, this was a longer episode. The next couple of episodes will be shorter as I will be working on a longer episode ranking the many, many westerns of the great spaghetti western actor Giuliano Gemma. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.